So I set to taking her apart and I found the most blatant, vile case of engineered to fail that I have ever seen. And here's the thing, it's a, actually beautifully engineered and well built, but there's just the one blatant thing that they did on purpose so that it would fail. Gentlemen, welcome back to the shop. Today we have La Bomba Multiusos on the bleed out table. Uh, this pump does not owe me a thing. I bought it for 90 Canadian pesos. I had it running 16 months, uh, 15,000 hours, say, and um, it still turns on and runs, but as soon as you put it in water, it craps out. So we'll have a little troubleshooting sesh, but then it's going back to the store because it's got a lifetime guarantee. So when we get the new one, we'll be able to uh, tweak it, what for making the pressures and the flows and the chooch factor better. So I went down to the Canadian version of Harbor Freight, which is Princess Auto. Here in Canada, everything's uh, automotive related. So we have Cambodian Tire, we got Princess Auto, we got some other ones I can't think of. But the great thing about uh, Princess Auto, um, even though they sell cheap Harbor Freight crap, is that their return policy is awesome. So this little $90 pump is gonna last me the rest of my life. And so here's the problem. You plug it in, it runs. As soon as you put it on in the water, the GFI outlet trips. And it trips another one in the house, which is a pain in the ass. Now GFI means ground fault interrupt. And the simple explanation for that is that it's monitoring the current that goes in through the hot lead and monitoring what comes out of the neutral lead so that if they're not exactly the same, it trips the breaker so that nobody gets electrocuted. And I even tried the capped on tape trick, the floating oscilloscope uh, capped on tape trick on the ground to see if I could fool the GFI outlet, which is totally dangerous. Uh, don't do it because you'll fry your wife and she will not be happy. But that didn't even work. So. I put the meter on it, just the fluke meter, and there was nothing wrong with the pump. But obviously there's got to be something wrong on the electrical side, because why else would it trip the GFI breaker? So I dug out the old Mega. This is a digital high voltage tester. It's a mega ohm meter. So your meter, your multimeter does ohm check, but it only uses like one and a half volts in order to maybe, maybe two volts in order to do that ohm check. And it sees the current coming back and it extrapolates the resistance of the circuit. Okay. So what this one does is instead of three volts, it uses 10,000 volts. So it's a, it's able to see a lot higher resistance. For instance, if the windings in here were starting to go, we'd be able to find out with this. And this is what uh, pros use to check motors and all that sort of stuff. So I'm going to show you how to use it. You can rent these, no problem. Um, you know, if you're looking at a piece of equipment or, you know, a machine tool or whatever, and you want to know if your motors are good, it's a good idea to uh, just rent one of these for the day and check it out. Or if you know an electric chicken, you can likely borrow one. Okay, so it would appear that we have no juice. Ah, looks like we need about $200 worth of C batteries. But what do you think, I made of money? I ain't Dave Jones. So we're gonna eschew the C batteries and figure out another way to make this chooch. Now we just gotta spend the rest of the evening looking through piles of junk, right? No, oh, wrong. Mama didn't raise no fool. I know exactly where my stuff's at. Well, what do you know? Top of the heap, our old friend. And look at that. Right full of lemon gin and ready to partay. That sounded less creepy in my head. All right, we got a kludge in there nice. And we only need to kludge in the one side, I think, because these are parallelogrammed, so no worries. And then this uh, shielding cable, we haven't used this since 76, so uh, no es necesito. Gan. Okay, we got to turn bottom size top wide. And, uh, 
No worky worky. Oh, gotta put the pokey bits into the wall. Everything's so fucking easy when you're a cheapskate. Spend a thousand bucks on a meter that you use twice a year. I can't afford batteries. Anyway, this is um actually this is the cheapest available, this X Tech one. This is the cheapest available that actually goes up to 10 kV. Normally, like the flukes and all that, they're 10 times the price and they only go to 5 kV. So uh, more is better. This one goes to, well, not 11, but 10 is pretty good. Look at these sneaky ice holes. They're in cahoots with the military industrial battery complex. They got wires all over the place. They got voltage and electrons leaking all over. So I can't figure it out. Rather, I refuse to figure it out. So uh, instead, we're just gonna chooch in some double A's. It fits in the hole, so it's a little sloppy. Like a hot dog down a hallway, but whatever. First time loose, second time. Pain right in the bum. The kludge continues. I have a theory now. I'm a busy guy. I got bills to pay, mortgages to buy, and groceries to eat. So this actually uh, sat and dried out for a while. So I, I'm going to put her in some scuzzy pond water here. Uh, not to worry. I got a permit. And uh, we're going to let her run in there. Oh, that water stinks. But uh, we're going to let her sit in there for a little bit, come back and retest it. Actually, what the hell? Why bother uh, letting it sit? Let's try it right now. Not gonna hurt nothing. Okay, to stimulate actual conditions, I've gone and put the pump in some greasy pond water, which I'm kind of rethinking now because it really stinks. But um, here we go. We got the earth on the ground pin. Uh, this is the guard we don't use. We're not using the guard for, it's something else entirely. And we got the high voltage red. So we're gonna turn the unit on. I started off at 1 kV, 1 kV, there we go, and then, yeah, so this will light you up like a Christmas tree on the 4th of July, so you want to make sure you got everything connected properly and you're not touching nothing before you start to test, especially if there's water or whatever around you, you're standing in a puddle of it, you know, yada, yada, yada. Don't melt your fillings. Here we go. So it hasn't even come up, we're just at 500 volts, so it obviously it senses that uh, something wrong there. So this failed, it's gone for 50 seconds, it's only at 500 volts, it hasn't even come up, so um, we can stop the test. It's so low current now that I've got it in the dirty scummy pond water that uh, it's not even registering, so low resistance rather. Uh, so this is a fail. All right, now that uh, we've tested the crappy one, we well, see it's, it's off the scale low on this. It's sitting in salty, briny water there. I wonder if we'll be able to read it with the old uh, Fluke 87. Oh, wow. Oh, I'm an idiot. Uh, we're going through the uh, motor, so three ohms. What we gotta do is, uh, yeah. Yeah, it's showing overload there. Let's try the other one. Uh, it would show the same thing. Oh, look at that. There we go. That's only 2K. So that is why the ground fault interrupt is uh, tripping out. I'll say, it, it'll probably settle out at 3K. It seems to be some capacitance there somewhere. I'm told that happens to the best of us as we age. Now just before I put this away, this, this comes in handy once in a while, but when it does come in handy, it comes in super handy, as I said, for, for testing gear. And you might think that spending a thousand bucks on an instrument like this is uh, stupid, wasteful. Uh, if you can rent them, it is, just, just rent one, but you know this has saved me a lot of money and also it can save you a lot of time troubleshooting too if, if you got something that's 
uh, intermittent that's working sometimes and not working other times. You know, you go in when it's cold and you test it, you go in when it's hot and aha, you find the problem right away. So it saves a lot of head scratching. And um, as I said, this is a cheapo, uh, you know, the fluke that goes to 10 kV, it's like 7,000 bucks, the X-Tech that goes to currently, that goes to 10 kV, I think is uh, 1,800, something like that. But having said that, there are insulation testers on the market that are good to like 1,000 volts, which is pretty useless considering a lot of industrial equipment is like 600 volts and 500 volts, you know, 480. And you really want to go about 10 times the rated voltage on a DC test to, to, to get a proper reading. Like if you're at a 600 volt system and, and you're only bringing it to 1,000 volts, well, I mean, root mean square, that's 600. So you're probably hitting 1,000 volts uh, just on the peaks of the AC. So it's kind of you know it's kind of useless but anyway you if you're into that sort of thing you uh, obviously already know that and yada 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 but this uh yeah i'm glad i own this it helps me sleep at night well the cagey bastards at the princess auto wouldn't take my la Bamba back son of a diddly so i brought her home if i've learned anything it's uh, given enough time and money we can fix anything so i plugged her in it was like shearing a pig lots of squealing not much wool. So I set to taking her apart and I found the most blatant, vile case of engineered to fail that I have ever seen. And here's the thing, it's a, actually beautifully engineered and well built, but there's just the one blatant thing that they did on purpose so that it would fail within a given time frame. We'll get to that in a second. And we'll start with the power cord, which is a really good power cord. It's a UL rated for 105, and it's also CSA rated for 105. So this is one of the best power cords I've seen on a tool. And it's that uh, Ta Sing, which was on the Makita hypoid saw as well, but it wasn't nearly as high quality cord. Now we come over here, and we've got the, uh, the strain relief beautiful strain relief and the ceiling gland and a proper metal ferrule to bolt on there retainers yeah and this uh, look at this this is awesome this is just ABS plastic that uh, sewer black sewer plastic but they put in steel threaded inserts so that uh, it would actually work and it wouldn't strip out so that is just Skookum. Very nice. Uh, we can see here, nice thick, uh, instead of just an O-ring, it's a, it's a proper gasket that they've actually had cut specifically for this piece of equipment. And uh, yeah, nice, lots of, uh, lots of uh, thickness there so it won't squeeze out. Now this is interesting, it's got a run capacitor, but it doesn't have a start capacitor. And uh, three leads here. So I haven't seen that before because normally the single phase motors um, have a start capacitor, the larger size, and potentially a run capacitor. So I kind of wondered what's going on here. And what's happening is there's actually two separate field windings. Now one gets fed from the hot and the other gets fed from this capacitor here. And of course going through the capacitor what happens is it, um, it offset the phases. So one will be one phase will be lagging and the other, and we essentially get two phases out of a single phase system in order to get this thing to turn on, start rotating, and maintain rotation. Of course, the power factor is going to be horrific, but um, yeah, it, I didn't have any problems with the motor. Of course, hearing that uh, squealing, I knew right away it was a bearing noise. Anyway, I don't want to get ahead of myself. This is an aluminum casting, beautiful, heavy, powder coated, and it's a nice thick hammer tone kind of powder coat, textured powder coat, very nice. And we can see here, we're starting to get a little bit of the white death, no green death on the wires though, but some white death on some of the stuff that's touching the aluminum. And here we have uh, the outlet. It's a threaded pipe connection, of course, the pipe is the worst fluid connection you can possibly get, but it's cheap and we are stuck with it. 
And the reason it's the worst is because there is a leakage path all the way up the spiral root of that thread form. So you gotta seal that up. You either seal that up by jamming something in there physically or uh, putting some Teflon tape on there. But there's a built-in leakage path. So like using these for hydraulic fittings and, and it's just horrible, but we're, unfortunately we're stuck with it. Now to actually get it split apart, we gotta come in through the bottom. And we got a nice little finger leaf guard here and uh, four bolts that thread into the aluminum housing so you could take that off and clean it out. And then it's shrouded here. Uh, that actually goes like that and it's shrouded here. And there's the impeller and uh, nice ABS impeller, thick impellers. There's no cavitation damage or anything like that. So obviously uh, well engineered. They have their flow rates right and everything's just tickety-boo, very nice. Look at that, it's even got a bronze insert, threaded insert, for installing this on the motor shaft. Now you have a look at all that rust. That's what they call foreshadowing. Okay, once you get that impeller threaded off of there, you can have a look at the motor housing. And lo and behold, there was some water ingress, obviously. Corroded the windings. Uh, they got hot and burned off the, what do they call that? There's a name for that and I cannot remember. Motor winding thread, it actually shrinks and hardens as it heats up Then they lacquer it on there. So clearly that there was the trouble with the high pot test. She just couldn't keep the electrons in. You know, the housing itself, you don't see very much uh, white death in there. Again, instead of an O-ring, they have a proper seal that they've actually gone and engineered and had cut or had manufactured specifically for this. Spare no expense. This is a good pump. So there's the motor rotor. It's got a nice big beefy bearing. Look at the size of that bearing. IPC made in Germany 6201Z. There's only one Z because uh, they're saving money on their shields. Of course that's a shielded bearing not a sealed bearing. In a pump you would like to see a sealed bearing. It's gonna be some water and not necessarily drops of it, but there will be some water ingress uh, get in there and we can see the shaft has had some contact with condensation at least. And then if we look down the rotor, we can see up to this level, at one point it was sitting in water. And we look further down, aha, a clue. And interestingly enough, in this housing is not one, not two, but three Buna and single lip seals to seal the shaft. Wow, that's amazing. Three seals, not one, not two, but three. Amazing. That thing will never leak, right? Well, here's the bearing that packed it in. You can see it packed it in so bad that it actually wore the shielding right around. The Germany is uh, half gone. Let me just focus that in, sorry about that. Rookie mistake. Anyway, initially uh, when I was messing around I thought this was a sprag bearing, a one-way bearing, because it would only turn one way. But uh, the reason of course is because it's hoopa juped. Now we come to the vile, dirty, dirty truth of the matter that this was engineered to fail after a set amount of time because Here's the first seal, second seal, third seal. This is a mild steel shaft. Well, it might be 1045, but it's not stainless. Fine, because getting a stainless shaft on a rotor is going to cost you an arm and a dick. However, you need to put a stainless sleeve on here for the seals to ride on. Because if you don't, every time this hits water, it gets a patina of rust. You start it up, the seal wears the rust away and uh, the seal wears and then when you take it out of the water it rusts again and so forth until your seals are completely worn out a year to the day. So by purposely omitting a stainless steel speedy sleeve on here, which is standard in commercial water pumps, uh, they have ensured that you have to buy another one of these every year or two. That is an engineered failure mode. 
And otherwise, this pump is so well built, so well engineered, that there's no other explanation that they omitted this to make more money. Vile, vile trick. And I am surprised to see an engineered mechanical failure. You know, just there's rumors of it happening in the electronics industry, you know, after so many hours that uh, that thing shuts down or, or they're buying super, super crappy caps that uh, dry out after a thousand hours at a certain temperature, you know, yada, yada, yada. And I've never seen it engineered into a mechanical component this blatantly. If you come across something similar, I would love to hear about it. Or if you have a differing opinion, please comment. Thanks a lot for watching. Keep your stick on the ice.